What's up, my friends? Welcome to another episode of the Whole Health of Rob Connie podcast. So this is a platform to connect with and share the stories of health professionals, personal development leaders, and health entrepreneurs who are making an impact in the world. So today we have our guest, Nashad Godridge, and Nashad is passionate about helping you feel more vitality and confidence in mind and body. His practice incorporates a holistic approach of functional strength, yoga, breathwork meditation, and coaching through habit change and accountability. So Nasha's goal is to empower and guide you along your path to improved health and vitality. He holds certifications in holistic lifestyle coaching from the Czech Institute, which is where we met, uh, functional health coaching from the Crescent Institute. He has his 200 hour yoga certification. He has done the GMB fitness certification, corrective ent- exercise through the NASM and massage therapy through the CAMTC. Nashad, welcome to the show, my friend. Thanks, Rob. It's great to be here. It's great to have you here. And this has been something I think that's been long overdue. Uh, it's it's crazy coming up on two years ago that we met in uh, April of 2019 at the Czech HLC2. I know. And it's crazy to think that it's coming up on two years. So, you know, let's just start with First of all, before we get to your story, how have the past two years been? Because I didn't even really put that together that we haven't seen each other in person since then. I know, I know. What a wild, like what a mind blowing experience that was, you know, at, at the Czech Institute. And so it's just, I'd say like since then, the last two years have just been a wild journey of, uh, you know, from there incorporating a lot of the holistic lifestyle principles that we learned you know, and doing that exploration on myself and the practice on myself before I could then really give to others. And so, you know, I'd say in 2019, when we met, I was really focused on incorporating a lot of those lifestyle principles and lessons into my own, uh, my own routines. And over the last year, it's now been focused on sharing that with other people. I can definitely say it's much of the same, you know, the past couple of years have been pretty crazy and, you know, there's a lot of ups, a lot of downs, but I think overall it's been two of the best years of my life. And I think that obviously 2020 was a roller coaster for, for many people, but I, I think that, you know, as we breed this resilience and we, you know, really just embrace the change, you know, a lot of great greatness can come out of that. So before we dive too far into that, I'd love to lead up to what got you here. So for Nashad, where did the story begin? You know, from the very beginning, what got you into holistic health and what got you to where you are today? Thanks, Rob. Uh, yeah, so, you know, my, my journey, you know, I think back to when I was little, you know, started, started on the soccer field, you know, ever since I was a little kid. And I remember I was six years old. It was at the World Cup when the World Cup was actually here in the U.S., my dad took me to go see a game at Stanford Stadium in, in California. We got to see Brazil play, and I remember that was the first time I really ever watched soccer, but I was just enthralled, and I was so excited, and I was in love with the game, and it was electrifying, the atmosphere there, and I, I just knew it, you know, at, at that age, I want to I play in the World Cup one day, you know, and my parents put me in all the sports growing up and, but soccer was my thing. It was my passion. It was my love growing up from that time back in 1994. And then, you know, played all the way through until, till the end of college. Um, but, you know, my, my journey really started there because it was, you know, like the field was really the, the teaching ground for me in terms of a lot of life lessons and, um, also in terms of physical health, uh, throughout my, throughout my teens, I ended up going through some pretty intense injuries, uh, on the soccer field. And as I, I started to get pretty competitive when I was about 15, 16 and started playing on more of a traveling team and, you know, going all over the country and the stakes got pretty high because everyone wanted to play at the next level, which was college. And, um, I kept pushing it and pushing it and pushing it, um, trying to uh, play and get out on the field to get seen, right, by all the scouts and the coaches. But then I was also going through a ton of injuries on my own. So long story short, you know, the the soccer experience growing up, um, it taught me so much in terms of like discipline and motivation and teamwork and 
you know, practice and, and also just the mental aspect of things as well, um, being strong mentally. Um, but it also um, gave me some pretty powerful, painful teachings in terms of um, some severe spinal injuries and concussions, uh, knee, you know, every single joint in the body. So that put me on the path of health and wellness at a pretty young age. Uh, you know, after the Western medicine wanted to, you know, do all these different surgeries on me and give me more and more painkillers, at a certain point, you know, I said, this is enough. There's got to be a different way. Um, I think I was around 20 years old at that time where I was considering a potential back surgery and I had already had like four pretty intensive surgeries. And so it was then that I started to explore, you know, things like acupuncture, going to different types of physical therapy, massage therapists, chiropractors, uh, energy type of uh, healers. And uh, I started exploring and practicing yoga myself. And, um, you know, throughout my 20s, uh, you know, after college, I moved to San Francisco. Um, there were a lot of farmers markets there. I got into nutrition and I was living with a roommate who just uh, was a for actually a doctor and nutritionist. So I started to learn a lot about anti-inflammatory foods, um, how, to, how to take care of myself in mind and body. Um, and then, you know, after working in the, the tech world in San Francisco for about four years, I realized, you know what, I want to do something more in health and wellness and um, has kind of led me on this path now to where we are today with holistic health coaching and incorporating, you know, all the different aspects of well-being. Awesome. And I'd love to just have you share a little bit more about the practice that you do today. You know, what are the, what are the services that you offer to people? Yeah, so... Um, I am, uh, I call myself a holistic health coach and the, the coaching part of things is around behavior and habit change. Um, so really getting to the root of, you know, our health challenges and our issues is really understanding how do we change our behavior? How do we change our lifestyle? Uh, and that's in terms of how we, how we think, you know, how we eat, how we sleep, how we communicate to others. Um, you know, how we, how we move our body, you know, how we breathe, all those kinds of things. Um, I have uh, extensive training and background in the physical training, rehab, and exercise strength side of things. So I've been in a lot of different settings in the realm of physical therapy and yoga and weightlifting and personal training. So I incorporate that into my work too. So some people I work with just doing physical training. Um, I also teach and offer mindfulness breathwork classes. Um, breathwork is a really powerful tool that I discovered about three years ago and have now been sharing that with other people. So I weave all these different things together in my, my coaching and my, my training. Beautiful. And, you know, I'd love to also just have you dive into your parents are from India. And that's a very different perspective than a mm -hmm. lot of people have. You know, the Eastern philosophies are clearly very different than the Western philosophies in many regards. I'd love to just have you share, you know, how having parents from India shaped your perspective in the world of health and just in general. Mm -hmm. That's a great, that's a great question because like, as, as you were saying that, like I was, I was just smiling because. I've actually been teaching my parents a lot of the, the Eastern philosophies and traditions. <laughs> and um, because, you know, they, they've been here in the States for, uh, I guess, over 30 years now. But what I, what I will start with is that, um, so I love food so much, Bob. I know like a lot of people love food, but, you know, food for me, it, it just means so much in terms of like culture and tradition and like joy and festivity and pleasure. And I love, like, I love the food from India so much. I was actually just there a year ago, um, got to just enjoy so much food from both Southern and Northern India. But, um, you know, I, I think food is, is really, really medicine. And as I've started to explore nutrition and how food can be healing, you know, a lot of my teachers and, and one of my doctors has said, you know, when I was going through some gut stuff, uh, a couple of years ago, it's just, just go back to like what your grandparents were eating, you know, and like the foods back from your home 
And um, so, you know, we cook lots of different curries with, you know, different spices and, and vegetables and, and uh, you know, using the, like the curry spices and stuff were really helped to improve digestion in, in the gut and to bring kind of that fire into the gut. Um, so from like a, from a food perspective, I feel like I learned a lot um, even though I didn't really know it at the time when I was younger, but um, as I've been learning more about also our, our Eastern cooking traditions and all the different spices, like things like turmeric and ginger, for example, have been really, really helpful. Um, but then like all the like the, the yoga and the, the meditation and those kinds of practices, you know, my parents actually didn't really practice or learn growing up. So I've, I've gotten to, to share that side of things with them. Well, it sounds like a very well balanced relationship, you know, each given each given something there. So that's pretty cool. And I can definitely say from my time being in Asia, you know, spending time in Sri Lanka and Thailand and Malaysia and the Philippines for I mean, granted, I was there for about four, four and a half months. So it wasn't, you know, not like a, a huge part of my life. But when I was so immersed over there, you know, that the four months felt like four years. Like I was so entrenched in that culture especially being so present you know a lot of people in the Sri Lanka you know we didn't have wi-fi or cell phones or anything like that so I was just living in the present moment and that was one thing that I really noticed about the eastern cultures is their level of presence and their level of gratitude and just the fact that they can really just you know enjoy life without as many shiny objects as we have out west here I think that it's very easy in this Western culture to get caught up with all these shiny objects. And I think that's something that, you know, this past year of 2020 has really shown a lot of people, you know, as, as things have been shaken up, you know, I think it's shown a lot of people what really matters, you know, with all these talks of what's essential and what's not essential. And, you know, I think people are recognizing, you know, health matters. Family matters, community matters, connections matter. And I know that you've been doing a lot of connection with men and the men's groups and the men's work. So I'd love to just have you share your journey and your experiences doing some men's work. Yeah, yeah, Rob, love to share about that. But I wanted to first reflect on what you shared about just, you know, back in the, you know, in India and the Eastern uh, countries like that sense of community is just so rich and I just wanted to point out you know when I was in India you know you, you just see people you know in the villages or or even in the cities they have nothing you know and but they're just so rich in life and culture and community and connection and and, and that was really palpable when I when I visited India and to see that you know just people ceasing singing and dancing in the streets and um, so that they, they have a lot to teach us in that room. Um, and then, yeah, bringing it back to your uh, point about, you know, men's groups and connections. So that's been a huge part of my life for the last three years now. And I actually just started my uh, first coaching group uh, for men, holistic health coaching group for men at the beginning of this year, uh, which has gone really, really well. Uh, and the idea behind that was I wanted to marry the, the concept of a men's group on one hand and then the health coaching on the other hand. I wanted to you know bring those two together. Um, I've been involved uh, in different men's groups over the last few years. One, one is with the, the Mankind Project. They're, they're a well-known organization throughout the world. And really it's this aspect of coming together, a group of guys coming together in a safe space to be able to talk about anything, to, to share anything. Uh, bringing it back to like my background, you know, growing up in sports, that environment, you know, there's, um, there's quite a bit of pressure that I felt, you know, to really, you know, create those walls around myself in terms of how I felt or to really not show any signs of weakness, um, you know, especially in a sports setting. And, you know, my mind has been blown in these different men's groups and being in groups of men who are open to sharing some of the like the deeper scarier sides or even the, any of the feelings for example and realizing like how much power there is in sharing 
you know, what's underneath the surface and, and really understanding that that is true strength and that is true courage and, and power to be able to share. 100%. Yeah. And I think that it's something I've really noticed as I've been doing ice and iron out here in Boston and having, we started as a men's group, then we, you know, opened up to, to women as well as things were locking down. And we're like, look, we don't want to exclude anybody. If people want community right now, we're going to give them that option. And now we've transitioned back to now we have a men's and a co-ed event every month. So that's been a great joy to have that balance. And, you know, with the men's group, some something that we've really come to the realization of is just the importance of embracing our emotions and the importance of, you know, not saying something's bad. Like it's very easy to say, oh, you know, being angry is bad. But if we can transmute that anger into something positive and productive, that's actually a very powerful emotion. And I attribute anger to the element of fire. So fire, yeah, you can burn a house down with a fire, but you can also create a campfire that can give life. And if we can use these emotions and no emotion is good or bad, it it just is. And it's how we determine how to use it. Just like any tool, you know, a hammer is not good or bad. It's how you use it. You can use it to hurt someone. You can use it to to make something. So that's been a big realization for me is that we've been doing this medicine ball toss where someone goes in the middle. We have a 20 pound medicine ball and you have to throw it as hard as you can at the other people around the circle. And you're not done until you get around the full circle. And there's usually like 15, 18 guys. So by the end, you're tired and you have to catch it back. So you're getting hucked at you. But the whole time, you know, there's a lot of yelling. There's a lot of grunting. There's that ex- that expression of the emotions and that male energy, which we don't really have many opportunities to express nowadays. Mm-hmm. And I like that you mentioned in sports, you know, that's really the only opportunity we have to show that competitive side and that aggressive side. But then there's the other side of the coin, which is, but don't show the weak sides, you know, show the strong macho sides, but don't show like the, you know, we don't care about your emotional problems. We just want, we want to win the game. So it's, it's finding that fine balance. Cause then in the beginning and the end, we have some time for checking in and reflection. And that's where some of those, you know, emotions come out. And it's, I think it's really just a balance of finding, you know, letting men be men express that, aggressiveness and again aggressiveness isn't a bad thing express that anger let those emotions flow through uninhibited and just enjoy it because if we can use this to our advantage those are some very powerful tools in our arsenal yeah rob I, i love that you brought up anger because this has been such an important topic in my life and in so many people around me. And, you know, especially in the last year, I've just noticed that, you know, this, this topic of anger and then the energy of anger has been around and it's, it is really a powerful energy if we learn how to use it appropriately and to really harness it in the right way. And you know, I, I just got lit up when you're telling the whole story of like tossing the medicine balls and just getting that like primal energy out, you know, you know, one thing that I've done in a lot of my re- retreats and groups is just just screaming. Right. Just, That's a great one. Like, That's a really just, good one. <laughs> just like lion roars and just screaming and getting it out, you know. And uh, one of my one of my teachers, um, uh, who's also a men's coach, life coach, his name is um, Shams Hartwell. He, he said it really well, you know, because ang- anger in itself isn't a bad thing. You know, like you said, it's, it's when we direct that anger to another person, then it becomes aggression. <clears throat> then the anger turns into violence, right? And so, you know, you think of like anger is just, it's just an emotion. It's just another energy that's coming through us, you know, like joy comes through us, like sadness comes through us or jealousy or whatever it is. And so, you know, when that energy comes through us, then we have a decision, you know, to make, like, how am I going to use this? Am I going to like, you know, take a pause, you know, be conscious of what's happening. And, you know, from there, can I, can I release it in a a healthy way? You know, and it's just like, you know, I was just thinking like last year in California, there were all these fires happening, you know, around all over California. I was like, wow, I think symbolically there was just a lot of anger that was burning up 
uh, on the earth, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, and it was like what was happening inside was also reflective uh, externally out in the world. So really, really powerful topic. And, you know, for anyone listening here today, it's, I, I think it's just important to not deny the anger or rather to allow and to accept the anger and, and know that it's okay. And there's nothing wrong with having that anger. And when we can kind of bring that feeling of what's in the dark out into the light and to bring it into our consciousness, then that's when we can, in a sense, release it in, in the proper way. Absolutely. And I think the other side of that coin of, you know, quote unquote, unfavorable male emotions is vulnerability. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're often told that, you know, if you're angry, you're being destructive, you know, you're out of control. And if you're showing vulnerability, oh, you're being weak. Oh, don't be a bitch. Don't be a pussy. Whatever these terms that we use to throw at other men. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what do you mean? <laughs> you know, part of that is, you know, someone just expressed some vulnerability and you're told, telling them not to be a baby, telling them to suck it up. You know, and to some degree, that is important at a survival level. And I've used this example before, you know, if you are the group of people hunting, someone breaks their toe, you don't want them complaining about their toe the whole time because your, your focus is to get the food. You know, there's a time and a place for all that. But oftentimes we're just conditioned to believe that showing vulnerable, vulnerability in general is a sign of weakness. But in fact, if we don't allow ourselves to be vulnerable, we're just going to be holding on to a lot of pain and a lot of resentment and a lot of just self-destructive habits that come with not fully expressing ourselves so I'd love to have you share just your perspective on as men how can we express our vulnerability in a way that is conducive to healing and conducive to growth yeah this is this is such a such a good topic because it's you know it's it's one of those things that um it, it take it takes a lot of courage right and uh i think that uh whether it's it's asking for help or it is, it is sharing how you feel, um, you know, it's something that I think at the very beginning, it requires a, a self-acceptance and a, and a self-love first, you know, to, to be able to go ahead and express that. I, I think that um, that's where the container of, you know, either a friendship, like a male friendship, you know, someone that you can really trust, someone that you consider as like a safe person in your life is, is really, really helpful. Um, or where, you know, having some sort of men's group or facilitator or container where there is already that structure in place where you know that you are safe to share. So I think what, what, ha what needs to really happen first is from like a primal level is knowing that you are safe, that I am safe. So I think we have to check in with ourselves first and tell ourselves, okay, I, I am safe and I am okay. In this moment to share because we're, we're basically like we're ripping off a layer of ourselves if you think of a visual right we're like we're ripping off a layer of our skin or some sort of mask that we're wearing and say hey rob i'm about to tell you about maybe a really painful experience of mine or something that i'm really shameful about and that's just like ripping ourselves open right um you know so you know i would obviously start with you know either, you know, a friend that you really, really trust or someone that you're confident in and, and, you know, starting off with saying like, I'm, I'm sharing this because, you know, I, you know, I, I really, I really care about, you know, our connection and our, our relationship and, and coming with that sort of base understanding is really helpful. Obviously, if it's in a men's group or a men's container, the, that there's, there's mutual understanding there that there is safety, um, that there is, um, a sense of non-judgment um, or compassionate understanding between the people in the group. Um, and, and also just realizing, you know, it's okay to ask for help and uh, it's, it's okay. It's okay to share, um, you know, and, and so what I will say is like, I, but I also know how scary it can feel. Like if you haven't had experience doing it before and if you're in that place, you know, what I would suggest is, is finding some sort of trained coach or uh, therapist or counselor or professional, you know, who's a completely like neutral, you know, third party in a sense, 
um, where you're not really worried about, um, you know, uh, maybe potentially ruining a, a friendship or, or being rejected, you know, because then it, it comes back to safety, right? It's mm -hmm. feeling safe in your body. So those are, those are the different, you know, suggestions that I help. And, you know, personally, I've, I've worked with a therapist on and off, you know, over the last three years, three, four years. And that has been one of the best things that I've, that I've done for myself in terms of my emotional and mental well-being. Awesome, brother. Yeah, I think it is definitely just something that, like you said, we need to feel safe. And, it come, you know, it's just the root chakra. It's our survival instincts. If we don't feel safe, you know, why would we open up and be vulnerable if we don't feel safe? We wouldn't. Mm -hmm. and I think that's something that is also a big challenge with this level of chronic stress that we live in, in our modern society. We're constantly in the sympathetic nervous system. We're constantly wound up to the highest degree. And that's where we see people just snapping. That's where we see this explosion of anger. It's like, whoa, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. But it's because one, they never allow themselves to relax and they've just pent up all this energy and they've never allowed themselves to be vulnerable. And I think you said, you know, it, then it becomes directed at someone or something. Mm -hmm. That's where you see guys, you know, punching holes in walls, you know, saying mm -hmm. things they don't mean, just that explosive compilation of all this trauma and anger and emotions all built up into one. So I think it really stems from how do we get ourselves into a parasympathetic state? Yes, because we're never thinking clearly when we're in that high, strong, stressed out environment. Yes, even someone like myself, who I think of myself is pretty well equipped to get myself into the parasympathetic state. There's still plenty of times that I get wound up. There's plenty of times that I get overly caught up in the stress and allow those emotions to come up. But then before they're about to bubble, I, I catch myself and I'm like, oh, I see what's going on here. All this stress is building up. I'm not, I haven't calmed myself. I'm breathing shallow. So some of the tools that we can really utilize to get into our parasympathetic nervous system, some of the stuff you spoke on earlier, meditation, mm -hmm. breath work, mm -hmm. yoga. Mm -hmm. I know that you've really dove deep into breath work. I'd love to just share, because I'm sure there's people listening at all levels of the breath work spectrum. Some people who have never heard of it. Some people who are, skeptical of it think like oh you know what is, how can that really do much and there's people that have turned into little t-rexes because they've done so much breath work in one session so i'd love to just hear your uh, your perspective on breath work and how we can utilize that tool yeah and uh i've experienced all of those forms of, of breath work <laughs> explored a lot i had some uh, chicken feet going on the other day i thought that okay. two left arms are one thing but yeah. I had some chicken feet going on too yeah 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 um yeah, so you nailed it. I, I, breath work is and can be, you know, a very, very powerful tool if, if used in the right way. And, you know, I mean, these are just long, long time traditions from Eastern practices and yoga, pranayama, where you can use the breath as a tool to change the, the internal systems in the body, you know, to change the, the, the nervous system, to turn on the parasympathetic, for example. And so, if we relate this back to uh, maybe a triggering stressful event, maybe it's a one individual trigger, or maybe it's sort of a chronic stress, the breath is your most powerful tool because we always have it. It's necessary for life. It's free. It's available anytime, anywhere, right here, right now. You don't have to go anywhere. And let's put aside all the different you know, techniques and what right now, it's just starting with a simple, deep belly breath. You know, as we talked earlier about feeling safe, right? So you're going through this trigger response, you hear something, you get a message and immediately, boom, the anger just triggers in you and you wanna go punch something or whatever it is. So you pause, you, you notice the thought, you notice the feeling you, and, and I guess what I'll share now is a, a practice that I've learned from one of my teachers. It's a self-connection practice, but it's breath, body, need, breath, body, need. So we pause and we take deep, slow breaths into the belly. 
And you can really visualize, you want to visualize that breath going all the way down to your root, literally your root chakra, your pelvic floor. And you can put your hands on your belly too, belly button, and feel that expanding. The exhale is, is more of a letting go. So again, to recap what we've just done, we've just potentially felt some trigger. There was an external trigger, then that triggered some feeling of anger or stress within us. So the first thing we're gonna do is go into the breath, slow it down. And the exhales, you can really draw out slowly and lengthen them. That will help to turn on the parasympathetic. Breathing into the belly, using the diaphragm, that will turn on the parasympathetic nervous system. So, you know, just doing even a few, like six rounds of that, you'll, you'll start to notice the shift. And then you can bring, again, the, the sensations to the, to the body level. So you can just feel like what's going on, in a sense, doing a body scan. You know, uh, what are the sensations that I'm feeling in the body? You know, what's going on? You know, do you need to move around? Is there, you know, tightness? Is there tingling? You know, what, what's going on in the body? And then again, coming back to the breath. And this is where you can do a little bit of investigation too, and then coming to the need. Okay, what is it that you really need right now? And and when I say need, it's not, I need you to do this. So that I'm talking about a universal need that is formless. So a need for connection, uh, a need for understanding, a need for uh, cleanliness, uh, a need for respect, a need for compassion, a need for love, I'm talking about these base universal needs. So then you can investigate through this connection practice, breath, body, need. And then, okay, maybe I was angry at that whole thing, but maybe what I was really needing in that moment was just someone to understand me. Maybe this person didn't understand me. And then I got triggered because there was miscommunication. And then what they're saying is telling me that they have no understanding of what I was saying or thinking or feeling. So you're going through this internal process of understanding, becoming conscious of what's actually happening through the breath, through feeling into the body, and then figuring out what is it that you actually need or what is it that the people involved need? That was beautiful. You just got me into a parasympathetic state. So thank you for that. That was, uh, that was nice. Wow. Feeling, uh, feeling good. Awesome. Sweet. Well, that was something I'm going to be practicing more often. You know, I think that I, I take times to do a few breaths here and there, or I do, or I do a, a larger session of breath work, but it's funny. I don't know if the number six, I don't know if that's a number of really practice i feel like i usually do like three or i do like 30 so yeah. i'm gonna start playing around with a little little different parameters there yeah you know i think that the six for example comes from if you're taking for example a breath of roughly you know five seconds in five seconds out okay that's 10 seconds and you do six of those that's a minute so mm -hmm. in a way it's just like even just like a minute of a few deep breaths can really get you into that state it doesn't you know take that long right yeah, I like that a lot. I'm definitely going to add that as a tool yeah. in my arsenal. Thank you. Sweet. And, you know, on that note, in terms of breath work and meditation, you know, I know we've, we've talked about shadow work before and some other forms of, you know, really getting to the root of what's going on. Because a lot of times, and I think things like archetypes can be very helpful, but I'd love to just have you share some other tools that you utilize to really get tuned in to what you're feeling and why you're feeling and kind of like root causes of emotions. Cause like you said, maybe that anger was cause the person wasn't feeling understood or they weren't feeling heard. They weren't feeling connection. So what are some tools that you can utilize or we can all utilize 
to really just tune into, you know, the why, why am I feeling this way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great, great question, Rob. And, and what we're getting at here is that maybe a deeper understanding or a, a deeper knowing of like what's really going on. And before I get into the tools, what I'll say is this is about tapping into something that's deeper inside of ourselves. This is about dropping away from the ego, the ego mind, the racing mind, um, because the ego wants to be right and wants to win. And, you know, and there's, there's a lot of judgments, you know, around the ego. So I first wanted to share that because whatever the, the tools are, there's a lot of different tools that we can utilize, but this is about coming into more of an embodiment, more of a deeper knowing, and you can call it, you know, this is a, a higher self, the, the still little quiet voice inside you spirit, source, God, whatever, whatever you want to call it. I also like to uh, talk about flow state, tapping into flow state. And okay, and so this is where we can then drop into a, a deeper level um, and higher, higher consciousness in a sense. So what, how, what does that look like? You know, what, what are different tools? I think, I think the breath is really a wonderful tool, a wonderful place to start. Um, and with the breath, you can obviously, you can explore uh, many, many different types of, of breath works and you know, prolonged uh, journeys of breath work. For example, I've done breath work like um, transformational breath work, or, which is based from, I think, rebirthing breath work, where you literally go on a journey, you know, when you're, you're breathing for like up to an hour and you can tap into a deeper state of consciousness. Um, you know, but even more simple things, um, I, you know, invite you to think about what, what brings you into a flow state in a sense. So for me personally, like I love to explore physical movement and embodiment where I'm moving the body. So, you know, you know, for some people it's running, you know, it's, it's running and you get into a trance and you get into this like deeper state, like the ego drops away and you feel like, you don't really feel your body so much and you're just more just you're in the flow um dance for me uh, has been a really powerful practice over the last few years um i've practiced different forms of um, a more free form dance so something called like static dance that i've practiced because it's this there's no rules in a sense other than you respect yourself and respect other people around you and you're quiet um I love um, music too, and obviously dance is accompanied by music that helps you tap into more of these flow states. So a lot of ecstatic dance music doesn't really have many words, but it's more of a instrumental or have some sort of beat. Um, that's why I love certain kinds of electronic music. Um, what else are good tools to do this? So like, you know, along the lines of embodiment, I've, I've done a lot of yoga and um, qigong type of movement so qigong or is more of a slower type of movement it's done from a standing position it's very similar to tai chi but it's it's a little bit um there's less movement you're more grounded the feet are more grounded and it's more of like a medical version of tai chi in a sense um, whereas tai chi tai chi is more of a martial art <clears throat> um yeah, I mentioned yoga, movement, whatever kind of movement practice might work for you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in, ther in therapy as well, um, because sometimes having a guide or someone to facilitate and ask questions, you know, and if you do that in com combination with breathing or meditation, because um, again, we're coming back to how do we quiet the ego mind? I think meditation, the, like a straight up meditation, if you're doing like a Vipassana meditation or just like a silent meditation can be really, really powerful. But, you know, for someone like me, when I first started, it was really hard for me to just sit still. Um, you know, now I'm in a more regular practice of sitting still. Um, you know, and I, I think there's also, um, you know, there's a time and place um, for, for using um, some medicines some some plant medicines to help us explore deeper levels of consciousness again you know that might be for you that might not be for you um and 
you know, I've had, I've had some, some journey type work where in a sense you're going into uh, the, like the dream world, you're going into a deeper level of consciousness and it's like having a lucid dream. And um, you know, the, the plant medicine journeys that I've done have been, you know, with a guide facilitator where I'm lying down with my eyes closed. It's like, I'm going into a dream of my own set, like lucid dream to really see what's underneath the surface and what are the things that my subconscious is is wanting to show um and then speaking of dreams um over the last three four years as i've um started to do a lot of these yoga practices um i also pretty much cut out alcohol from my diet like three years ago i've been dreaming more or rather remembering my dreams more so i try to write them down in the morning um, I, I do it, um, or at least when I wake up, remember, oh, what was it that I dreamed about? And I think that's a really powerful way to see into the subconscious. So yeah, those, those are some different things that I've explored in terms of how do we tap into that, you know? I love it. And, you know, I think what a lot of it comes down to is changing our state. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the common theme I'm seeing from a lot of these, you know, when you're in yoga, you know, you're changing your mm -hmm. state. You're going from presumably standing or sitting to now getting into a flow. You're moving, you're breathing, you're changing your state. When doing breath work, you're changing your state. Meditation, changing your state. Plant medicines, changing your state. You know, entering your dreams, obviously, is a completely different mm -hmm. state. So that's something that I've really been focused on lately is how can I change my state? And a lot of one of my favorites is cold showers mm. or just cold exposure in general. Yeah. And that's the, for me, one of the quickest ways, if I'm feeling any type of way that I don't want to feel as soon as I get in that cold shower, those feelings are completely wiped away. You know, the, <laughs> the freezing underwater, <sighs> breathing, trying to get that centered breath, you know, starting off, <gasps> And then getting down to that nice calm, mm -hmm. especially here in Boston, the pipes get very cold. You know, it's, 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 <laughs> I, we, we honestly have said, we think it's easier to do an ice bath and take a cold shower in Boston in the winter, you know, cause you can't, it's harder to settle in the shower cause it keeps coming at you mm -hmm. or in a, an ice tub, you can only sit there. The water's not moving and you can kind of feel into it. But I think when we can change our state, that's something we can do, you know, very quickly. Like we just did 60 seconds of some breath work, mm -hmm. a quick cold shower, just shaking, shaking the body out, uh, like just ecstatically shaking, you know, the ecstatic dance, like you said, music, like you said, all these are little tools. And just like anything, a tool can be good or it can be bad. It's just how you use it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're feeling angry, you know, maybe hardcore rap music isn't the best thing or maybe it is because maybe then you get it out mm -hmm. i think it all just comes on a an a instance by instance basis and it really it just comes down to is practice and learning different tools and knowing when tools are applicable because sometimes i'm angry the best thing i need to do is go back to some old that old angry eminem or some other rap music and just rap along with it and let that out and then after it's like it's out of my system but sometimes that comes on. I'm like, God, I don't want to hear this. This is putrid. This is vulgar. This is whatever. But sometimes that same tool, depending on what I need, can be a medicine or it can be a poison. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at the end of the day, it, it just comes down to adding more tools to our toolbox. And that's what I'm always telling people is like, there's no master skeleton key. There's no one size fits all. You know, just like you said, with the running. Running for one person could be getting them into a flow state. Running for another person could be the most torturous experiment ever done on a human being. And it just depends on the person by person basis. And I think that we just need to continue to add tools to our arsenal and know when to use them. Yeah. That's such a good point, Rob. Uh, you know, it's just, I, I tell my clients this all the time, you know, what works for me might not work for you. And, and that's where we get to explore and experiment and, you know, and I think there's, there's fun in that too, because, you know, we, we're each on our own individual journeys and exploring, you know, we have different backgrounds, different stories, you know, different things that we've been carrying. So, um, and different bodies, right. You know, so 
it's it's really important to explore. And I love that you brought up the the cold the cold immersion. I I jumped I jumped in the the pool this morning for my, for my birthday. <laughs> Got a little bit of a cold exposure. Maybe not as cold as the the Boston cold, but um, you know I I like jumping in the ocean too, the Pacific Ocean. It's 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 cold enough. <laughs> that's the trick. That's for Don yeah. sure. And for everybody listening, it is Nashad's birthday. So <laughs> when this comes out a few weeks later, make sure you wish him a happy belated birthday because he will be what what year is this for you now? What 30, you, 33. 33. Is, that's a special number. It is. That's yeah. a special number, a special year. What did what's the plan? I guess. Let's go into that real quick. What's the plan for the special number 33? What's the for, for this next year or for today? <laughs> for this year. Well, we can do both for today yeah. or this year. Um, you know, it's, I have to say, it's it's really about sharing more and, and sharing sharing more of my gifts and sharing more of my story. And, um, you know, I'd say for, for a lot of my life, there's this, I, I've wanted, like the ego part of me has just wanted to hide in a sense. Um, because that's where I've been more, more comfortable. And I've been primarily just working with, you know, individual people one-on-one. And, you know, like we talked about earlier, I'm now doing more group coaching um, now, you know, making more videos and, and doing more classes. I, it's really just about sharing my joy and my gift with the world. Um, you know, when things open up to like, I, you know, I have dreams around doing more retreats, holistic health retreats. So there's, there's definitely going to be more of that in my life. And, um, because I think it's just really powerful, right. When we all come together in community and just, just share a lot of the different practices and things that we enjoy, uh, with each other and share stories and share, you know, breath work practices, you know, share movement practices. So there's going to be a lot more of that this year. And I'm really, really excited to share that, you know, obviously right now I'm doing it more in a virtual sense. Um, so that's what I really see, you know, and, um, just more, more love and community and, and, you know, family time in my life too. So seeing a lot more of that. So, yeah, and then in terms of today, I'm you know planning to do a lot of that today. I, you know, I taught taught a class this morning. I jumped in the water. You know, connecting with you, talking about things I love, and I'm gonna be cooking some food later, and you know, having some family come over. So, um, basically, doing all that today too, I guess. <laughs> well, that sounds like a damn good way to start off the the new birth year, brother. So. Well, this has been awesome. This has been a great conversation. I'm grateful that you chose to come here on your birthday, which is really exciting. I've, I've done a podcast on my birthday, but I don't think I've ever had a guest come on their birthday. So this is definitely a first, which is pretty cool. cool. So where can people get in touch with you and get involved with all the cool stuff you're doing? Yeah, my website is resilientbeing.me. Uh, that's why so you can find information on all my offerings for one-on-one the group coaching classes and then I'm on social media as well with the handle at resilient underscore being and you can message me there as well um, and, and just take a look at you know the information I have there and all my offerings and so those are the best places to get in touch and yeah would, would love for you to reach out if you have any any kind of interest in what we talked about today Awesome, brother. Well, thank you for sharing. Thank you for being you. And I'm super excited to continue this journey together. I'm excited for people to dive into your work and involved with what you're doing. And to everybody listening, we thank you for being here. I thank you for the support. If you haven't already, we'd love for you to subscribe to this podcast, share it if you found like there's anything interesting. Check out um, Nashad's stuff. I'm going to put some links in the description box here if you didn't catch that or you just want the direct link. And everybody listening, have the best day ever, and we'll see you on the next episode. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Whole Health with Rob Carney podcast with our guest, Nashad Godridge. So I really would love for you to check out the cool stuff Nashad is up to at his website, www.resilientbeing.me. You can check them out on Facebook and Instagram as well, and I'll put those links in the description box here. So if you found any value in this podcast, which should be hard-pressed not to find anything, would love for you to share it with a friend, a family member, 
anybody you think that could benefit from hearing this conversation. Obviously, Nashad is a wealth of wisdom, a wealth of experience and knowledge, and would love to share his message with the rest of the world. And we'd love for you to support this podcast by sharing this, by liking, subscribing, and, you know, leaving a review. We'd love for you to re- leave a review. Always appreciate any support that we can. Allows me to keep it going, to keep it growing, and keep it flowing. Have more great conversation with other great guests like Nashad. And another great way to support this, this platform here is with our superfood sponsors. So if you check out wholehealthconnects.com, you can see all the superfoods that we have on there. So if you go to the superfood nutrition tab, you can check out things like the notorious liquid sunshine, the apple berry, apple berry power shake by Purium. You can check out the 30-day Ultimate Lifestyle Transformation, which is one of the most popular products. But one I want to talk about today is the Holistic Fitness Pack. So that's a pretty new pack with Purium, and it's really, really a heavy hitter. I think it's pretty underrated with both MVP Sport, both the chocolate and vanilla protein, two Super Mino 23s, Super Lights, Super Xanthan. You know, Xanthan is a really underrated supplement that we can utilize for both our skin health, our eye health, and our fitness recovery. And of course, we really can't beat this, and that's just, you know, the heavy hitting. You know, I don't, it's not a heavy hitter. You know, it's actually a very subtle, but very effective natural pre-workout. So the Holistic Fitness Pack is a holistic approach to fitness that requires specialized formulas. So the pre and post workout products will help to transform your body and your approach to fitness and help provide noticeable differences and improvements in your performance. So many common effects of the Holistic Fitness Pack. It supports healthy oxygen, nitric oxide, and nutrient levels in your blood helps to reduce lactic acid dehydration and deficiencies that lead to headache, cramping, and fatigue, promote rapid recovery and repair of new muscle growth, and promote more elastic and tighter skin and lean muscle synthesis. So if you check that out, you can either go directly to my website, wholehealthconnects.com slash superfood-nutrition. Check out the Holistic Fitness Pack. Use the discount code nutrition to save 25%. Or you can just go right to the website of ishoppurium.com, use the discount code NUTRITION, and type in the Holistic Fitness Pack to get your Holistic Fitness Pack for 25% off. So, as always, thank you so much for your support. Thank you so much for leaving a review, for liking, for sharing, and have the best day ever. Appreciate you. I love you. Thanks again.